You're listening to the Digital Signage Today podcast. As business leaders look for ways to improve productivity and profitability, they're increasingly turning to innovative automation and self-service technologies. But keeping up with the rapid pace of new innovations can be overwhelming. Now there's a website to help you do just that. From the publishers of Kiosk Marketplace, Vending Times, and Digital Signage Today, automation and self-service covers trends in artificial intelligence, robotics, kiosks, payments, and much more. Visit the site today and subscribe at www.automationandselfservice.com. Hello, and welcome to the Digital Signage Today podcast. I'm Daniel Brown, editor at Digital Signage Today. We're joined by Daryl Cooter, president and co-owner at Red Dot Digital Media. Daryl, we've followed your work for a little over a year now, and you've done some of the most creative uh, installations that I think I've seen in the global specialty integrator space. Uh, including the Gameway video game uh, airport installations, uh, which I was privileged to use, I think it was last year in Dallas. Now, for some of our audience members who may not know uh, or have been following what you do, could you go ahead and introduce yourself and, and what you do at Red Dot? Yeah, so I'm Daryl Cooter. I'm one of the owners of Red Dot Digital Media, and we specialize in doing uh, national and global deployments, more specifically on the BrightSign hardware platform using multiple CMSs based on clients' needs. And our services range from setting up and configuring all the media players to the deployment, um, to doing content and graphic design for customers, and then providing technical support, uh, both phone and email-based support for not only the content we design, but also the level one support for the CMS and the hardware that we provide as well. So this is hardly a, you know, buy something out of the box, never hear from me again. This is an ongoing customized, we've got your back kind of a support deal. Yeah, it's actually something we're really proud of. You, you know, as we've all seen in all different industries, the idea of calling a support person has kind of gone out the window. It's, you know, there's a lot of, Every time you call, it's voice automated. You know, you don't really have an opportunity to get to someone. Sometimes it feels like that's by design. Uh, Other times it's just a difficult system. So it's something that we wanted to offer um, and let customers or, or even other AV integrators we work with who have a technician in the field that needs some assistance in real time, give them the ability to call us. You just hit our tech support extension and someone picks it up and, and helps you out. So something we're, we're proud of doing. And, and it seems to, for whatever reason, kind of be going by the wayside. Well, it's funny you say that because in the past a little over a year now, uh, one of the themes that we keep seeing in digital signage today is that human touch is more important than ever, even as all this AI and holograms and Star Trek stuff keeps coming out. People need to remember, it seems, that human touch will really not just grow, but sustain your business. Would you say that's a fair theme? Yeah, I definitely believe that. And, you know, I'm not sure if if there's a generational thing, if older people in the industry prefer more of that hands-on, you know, talking and, and that personal touch you're talking about. And younger generations really don't even care. Um, I don't know if there's any of that involved in this. Uh I'm 48 and I personally like to be able to call and just quickly get to someone rather than having to go through a chat or a whole list of press this number or that number. And so I I agree with you that having the ability to communicate and have that personal touch with the other person or the other company to me goes a long way. And we hope that people that we work with our clients and integrators that we work with value that because we take it pretty serious. I, I love that. We were just at uh, in Charlotte. I, I was privileged to work and, and see EJ Kritz present on some new research on Gen Z. And paradoxically, uh, younger people are really into experiences. They're really into the human touch. And I think what you say really dovetails with some new data coming out of various verticals. 
Now, one of the verticals that I was really curious, because you have this broad perspective, uh, we've got a hot button topic in digital signage lately, this digital menu boards and digital digitalization and digitization. Um, and I'm curious, what kind of experience have you had in that world? I mean, we see QSRs, restaurants, all kinds of businesses and verticals adopting. Uh, have you dipped your toes in there? Yeah, actually, that's how we got our start in the digital signage business. You know, prior to being a digital signage specialty integrator, many, many years ago, we ran a business as an AV integrator. And in trying to get into the digital signage space as where we wanted to move our business to, um, sort of our first opportunity was with digital menus. Uh, as an integrator, we used to do local restaurants in the San Diego area. And that's actually how we uh, discovered BrightSign was trying to do that and looking for a reliable product. And one of the first trade shows we ever attended was with BrightSign. I think it was back in 2013 was the National Restaurant Association trade show in Chicago. And we had done that for probably eight years. I think it was only when COVID started that we didn't, uh, we decided not to go anymore, partly because they didn't hold it that year. Um, but we had been doing the restaurant trade show um, and really specializing in, in digital menus. Um, we worked directly for a while with U.S. Foods as one of their partners in their um, buying program for their customers as the digital menu provider. And so we have a lot of history doing digital menus as Red Dot Digital Media. That's amazing. I love that. And I just want to zero in. This is something that we had mentioned Um in our previous conversation with Gameway, I think you're not necessarily a promotional partner with BrightSign, but you you really seem to like using their stuff. Can you just say a word about what made you? And it sounds like you're willing to work with with other hardware and so forth, but you really enjoy using that BrightSign ecosystem. What's going on there? You know, like I said, when we first started out as an AV integrator, just sort of dipping our toes in the digital signage space and and trying to learn more about it. You know, one of the things at that time that was always very difficult for me is we were working with large scale manufacturers and I won't mention any names, but, you know, we were be being shipped product that was essentially dead on arrival. Like you, you open it up uh, and the, the product wouldn't work or something would happen and immediately you'd have to contact technical support and try to figure out why this device wasn't turning on they would end up ultimately, you know, shipping us another one. And that cycle just seemed to continue a lot, at least for us and in, in, in the AV world with certain AV products. So as we were looking to transition into the digital signage industry specifically and get out of the AV integration business, finding something that was reliable, having dealt with the costs involved of, you know, having a product dead on arrival, there's a lot of labor involved that maybe a lot of people don't realize or take into account when you've got to replace a, a product. And so when we came across BrightSign, prior to that, we were using PCs and uh, we hadn't done a lot of projects to that at that point. But when we found BrightSign, you know, one of the things that they were definitely advertising and promoting was the reliability of their players. And we absolutely found that to be true. And I can even tell you after, you know, selling BrightSign for 15 years now, and we even have clients, some of our very first clients that we had sold early BrightSign players to, those players are still running over a decade later. I mean, it's just, it's impressive. And when wow. you consider, yeah, when you consider what the the players are doing and the fact that a lot of them are repeating content over and over again, which has a lot of uh, wear and tear on the the hard drive or in Bright Science case, the micro SD card, just the quality of their components um, has still to this date been something that has really given us a good feeling about the the quality of what we're deploying because it, it's a direct reflection on us of what we're recommending from a hardware standpoint. And so we've definitely 
come to be a true, true supporter uh, of the BrightSign hardware based on experience and experience only. And we're just very grateful that this product exists and we've become as good as we have at it. And we're able to do a lot, a lot of things that, that might not normally be done because of all the features and, and IOs that they have included in their players. And, you know, I've said a lot in the past that just because you can do it on a bright sign player doesn't necessarily mean you can always do it in different CMSs that work on the bright sign platform. But the reality is, is that with the bright sign player, there is a lot that you can do uh, from triggers and sensors and a whole bunch of stuff um, that they make it easy to do. Even like GPS uh, locating, uh, triggering content based on GPS locations. Like these are really advanced features that not every media player supports. And so they've gone out of their way to make sure that those, those exist and work in their, their hardware. That customer obsession again. I, I love that, that people focus, make it easy. And what I love about this industry, I've worked in quite a few over the years. I'm not going to give away my age, but, uh, you know, th- th- there are so many sincere people who will tell you what they think. They, they, they don't have any kind of commercial relationship. I'm certainly not getting any kind of kickback for asking you, you know, which hardware you prefer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're just telling me this is my experience. And of course, as a 90s kid, I remember watching Alex Trebek, Jeopardy, uh, with my mom and mm-hmm. seeing the commercials for the little purple pill. So I want to tell people, get the little purple pill called Bright Sign. Right. Um, so, so when you're advising folks, let's say you're talking to maybe a QSR who's just beginning their research, we're seeing a lot of small to mediums and mom and pops jumping into dig- digital signage now. Mm-hmm. What kind of considerations should be given as you're planning your store, your franchise for the hardware side, the software side, choosing your integrator and installation partner? Yeah, you know, one of the things that we experience, like part of our um, our agreement with our the U.S. Foods partnership that we had was they were providing, you know, they provide food to restaurants of all sizes. And part of that was handling small to medium sized mom and pop restaurants. Um, Whether it was a handful of locations or just a one-off location, you know, some of the things that we learned along the way was that the cost is a little bit more than most of those size restaurants are either prepared for or had anticipated. And so, you know, you definitely want to go in with something that is not over the top and, you know, something that you would think a McDonald's or a large uh, franchise would be using. They're typically looking at probably a much more basic setup. Um, You know, integrating with a POS system is, I'm not referring to that specifically. That's something that based on the CMS, it's either going to do or it's not. Um, but from a hardware standpoint, you know, taking into consideration, is this a restaurant that's open 24 seven or can you spec in a monitor that's only 16 seven and, and save some dollars there? Are you able to use a, uh, uh, a commercial grade, uh, monitor, uh, are, what type of media player are you putting in? And then even from the CMS side, you know, one of the things that, I don't think a lot of restaurant owners think about is, you know, like I would mentioned, the, the POS integration and whether it already exists or what the cost is to actually integrate that. You know, a lot of times that becomes the biggest barrier that we have seen is they want to be able to integrate their digital menus with their POS. So as pricing changes, it only does it in one location. And, you know, that's, that's easily doable. But the reality is, is that, it does cost money a lot of times to do a one-off integration or from a CMS side, if they're doing it, you know, we're not a CMS. We're, we're more of a, of an integrator from that standpoint. So to have a CMS that has already been integrated with toast or, or something like that might be more common. But when you talk about integrating with a smaller POS system, you know, it's probably not, it's probably not available. And a lot of times in order to make that work, there is a a larger upfront cost involved because someone has to go in there and do the programming. So a lot of times that's not taken into consideration. But also too, I think when you look at the cost of 
everything that's needed, let's just say on a three screen menu, you know, you've got an, probably a 43 or a 49 inch monitor or something like that. You've got a mount, uh, a media player, whether it's one that feeds all three or it's three individual media players, you've got the installation that's got to occur. You know, a technician has got to show up, put up the screens, put up the mounts. Um, maybe that same installer or another uh, contractor is pre-wiring the restaurant for the menus, the electrical. You've got the cost of the uh, CMS itself, which, you know, as, as we've seen out there, has a wide range from a hundred to four hundred dollars a screen, depending on what your what CMS you're using. Pretty soon, these things start adding up, where you could easily be at an average of three thousand dollars per screen, and that that would that'll vary again based on what you end up doing. But so, if you're putting in a three screen system, you know you're looking at nine or ten grand potentially. Uh, all in, including graphic design work. Someone's got to design the menu, the layout. Is it going to be someone that the client already has worked with? Is it going to be someone like us? Is it going to be a, a third party marketing company that they've hired as well? So a lot of factors go into that, that I think they don't realize up front. And then it, it's so strange living in this day and age. It's funny you mentioned this uh, local mom and pop shop. We, we covered a local coffee shop. A few weeks ago, and they did exactly what you're talking about. They were looking at, you know, are we just running the screen eight hours a day? Can we just get a screen from Walmart? Every consideration you listed, the guy was telling me about as the owner of this tiny little coffee shop. And then yeah. he said, you know, I couldn't afford, I didn't have the extra money for a professional graphic designer. So I used one of the AI ones. And that mm. blew my mind that we live in the day and age of generative, this generative AI movement. And he said, yeah, you know, it came up with some pretty good designs. And when I finally got one that I liked, we used that on the menus. And I was like, that's, that's new to me. That's the first time I've heard of that. I, I don't mean to jump off script, but I'm curious, have you seen a lot of AI impact in this realm? Kind of like he was saying. You, uh, personally, not from a graphic design standpoint. Um, that That's a brilliant idea. It sounds like for, for that client to, to go out and have done that. Um, you know, we, we have graphic designers on staff. So uh, generally that's not something that we are looking at doing. We're actually doing the design work like uh, upfront, but I mean, if I'm being honest, that's not a, a bad idea for a client that, that might need that extra help. Um, you know, from a, an AI standpoint, I think AI has a place in the digital signage world for sure. And I think that will grow over time. You know, I don't know how much talk the right now about AI with certain CMSs is real. Um, I don't know how much talk about the products they're putting out is truly AI versus something else. Um, I think that'll all kind of wash itself out here in the next few years. But the idea of incorporating outside of your example about graphic design, but AI into digital menus, you know, it's probably going to be something like a lot of early adaption where it's really just used by companies with big budgets that can afford to have something custom made for the very first time. And then that's going to trickle down as a repeatable service. Um, but I do like the idea of, you know, being able to do things on digital menus, like producing uh, different menu items based on the time of day or menu promotions based on weather, um, being able to target a, uh, a customer maybe based on some sort of a, a beacon built into the app on their phone. And when that customer walks up, there might be something on the menu or at the kiosk that recognizes that uh, customer and, and maybe provides suggestions based on past purchases. I, I definitely think there are places for that in the restaurant business. My personal feeling is they're not going to be, it's not going to be seen at the mom and pop level for a while just because of the costs. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I, I love that. It almost reminds me of chatting with the programmatic digital out of home folks about the innovations they're making and even things like, oh, it's snowing. Well, what a great time for hot chocolate, you know, yeah. or, oh, the last go let out. Well, what about an after school lunch special or you name it, a uh, ways to add value, but in a way that feels like a human touch, which again is such a huge theme. Now with this content, I really want to dive into that because I, I love the way you dissect it. In terms of the digital media board content, what works, what doesn't? And if you could say anything to people that are just adopting the technology, how should they shape this content? And I'm just going to add one thing that I, I didn't think of yesterday when I was drafting our questions today. You know, I went to a restaurant recently that just installed a digital menu board, and I was very mm -hmm. excited to check it out because I cover this stuff. And I was squinting because it was very pretty. The colors were great. And they used a tiny font. So mm -hmm. I'm leaning over the counter trying to see the prices. So I'm mm -hmm. curious, what kind of content tips do you have? Yeah, that's a great question and a great example, too. So, you know, in the years that we've done this, I, I think you might... You, you might find different content tips. Like if you talk to five different people, you might get four different answers. Like a couple of people might share the same thoughts, but I can tell you from our experience, one of the biggest mistakes I see out there, um, well, is using some sort of a thumb drive with a looping video and where you can see as that thing loops over, you can actually see like the play, uh, the play tabs show up and it, it just looks really cheap and bad. And I know that's not necessarily content related, but that's one thing I do see out there that I wish I would stop seeing. Um, when it comes to content though, I think some of the mistakes that I've seen are when uh, the digital menu board switches uh, on a single screen, switches from the menu to something different. And what happens is when you when you take away the line item menus while someone is at a digital or looking at a digital menu board ready to order, you really slow down the speed of the customers in line. Everything starts to slow down because as you're trying to find something that you want on the menu and the menu disappears and shows, you know, some promo for some type of product and that customer has to wait then for that to come back around. I just think that's a huge mistake in digital menu design. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see it a lot, but when I do see it, you know, it definitely makes me think that there's a lot of better ways to have done that. The other thing that I see, which I think is a huge mistake, is when they don't incorporate space on the screen to show imagery of the food. I can tell you from my personal experience as someone who goes into restaurants and, and purchases food, I'm more likely to purchase something when I get to see an image of it than when I just simply get to read the text. And so one of the things that we advise our clients on is let's carve out either on a little space on every screen, or maybe we dedicate a screen to it, but let's definitely show imagery of the food because we can use that area as an upsell opportunity, especially with foods with higher margins, things like that. Um, those are the things that, you know, you don't necessarily want to be promoting your French fries unless they're world famous and you're known for it. Like you want to be promoting things that really drive revenue. And the best way to do that is typically through imagery. And so having a menu board with no images, and it's basically a static sign. I mean, it's kind of rule number one, as far as don't, don't do that because you're just wasting your money on a electronic billboard. At that point, you might as well just go back to printed menus. Yeah. Picture is worth a thousand words. Or dollars, maybe. It depends. <laughs> Which is even better. Yeah. And it reminds me, we chatted with uh, one of the fellows who he, he does um, international events for like, um, I think he said, you know, Disney, Marriott, big companies, big mm -hmm. events. He mentioned the power, not necessarily of super mega levels of motion, but throwing in some motion, not just having static pictures, he said has made just a world of difference. And I think one of his number one tips to us, uh, we weren't talking about QSRs at that time, we were talking about more the event side, but he said, if you have a little bit of motion, you know, the human eye evolved to watch that motion, it's automatic, you don't think about it. So just adding a little motion can change everything, whatever you're trying to design. And I thought yeah. that was fascinating. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, I would definitely agree with that. Anytime that you can build in, 
even just the slightest animation, if, if that's all that either you can afford or, you know, keep in mind, there are CMSs out there that can generate some animations automatically for you that it's a, you know, maybe it's built into the CMS. Otherwise you're having to hire someone to create the animation. So it does depend on, you know, what the animation is as far as what it looks like and how it's on the screen. But I, I definitely agree. I feel like, you know, the digital menu board in t inside of a QSR is definitely the one opportunity or the main opportunity, I should say, that a restaurant has to grab someone's attention. You're naturally going to walk in and look at that thing while you're standing in line waiting to order. Make it interesting, make it fun, make it move, and, you know, make it worth your money as the, the restaurant owner. And so, uh, you know, I think having animations are, are great, motion graphics, that kind of thing. You know, one other thing that I will point out that we see a lot of and, and we're constantly trying to advise clients to, to slim it down a little bit is too many menu items on the screen. And a lot of times, to your point, Daniel, they have to then make the text extremely small in order to fit it all. And... You know, we, when we first started out, we had sort of this guideline of you really don't want more than 15 or 20 items on a screen max. I would probably even argue now today that even that's too many. Like if you were to walk into a McDonald's and you actually look at how many menu items are on a single screen, it might be five or six. Um, I mean, it's minimal. And and that in turn, though, is what gives a company like that the rest of the screen to also do animated promotions and upsells and, and things like that. And I think that's a, a big thing that smaller restaurants struggle with is for some reason, they all want to have, you know, 40, 50 menu items. And when it comes to digital menus, that's the wrong direction to go into, in my opinion. You, you got to have a small narrow, concise menu gives you more room to do more on the screen. And avoiding the decision paralysis. I remember years ago, I was a huge <clears throat> Jeff Robert Ir Irvine, and uh, in all of his television shows, he would go after the restaurants with, you know, a hundred menu items. And he's like, yeah. you, there's too much to pick. There's no way you can keep all this in stock and keep it fresh. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. I love it. And it's like uh, some of the research I've been seeing, database decision-making is exposed advertising. And I keep seeing the number seven. There's something in the human brain on average. There, there are like seven blocks of short-term memory. And if you're trying to decide between a bunch of things, once you get above seven, a lot of people start shutting down and being like, oh my gosh, there's just too much information. So I'm, I'm interested in this. I actually made a note. I'm going to ask our next guest about this too, because I'm fascinated. And one thing you mentioned, uh, you kind of touched into this interactivity. A lot of folks are talking about experience design. And I'm hearing people talk about, oh, well, there's metaverse. You need to have QR codes, mobile phone interactivity. People are talking about, oh, my gosh, if you don't have AI integrations, you're nothing. How do you differentiate in digital signage between a fad and a gimmick and strategies that really work and engage your customers? And let's face it, build your bottom line in ROI. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Whether it's a fad or a gimmick, or something that is really here to stay. I think maybe that's something that time will tell. Um, I think maybe also the, the ease of which that technology is capable of being integrated and capable of having the costs come down over the years, I think is another thing. All of these great technologies, some are very low cost and easy to incorporate. You know, you, like you mentioned the QR codes and ordering on your mobile phone. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, that's that's super easy to do. It's being done all the time. You know, we're doing it in all different verticals, not just restaurants where you're taking the content from that screen and, and putting it to your mobile device so that you have a little bit more comfortability maybe in, in how you're using it. Um, so I think there's things like that that are here to stay. Uh, you know, in reference to something like the different things that are being developed in the AI space, I mean, we'll see. I, I think there's a need for it and there's a lot of good 
companies out there working on good opportunities right now. But, you know, when COVID hit, a lot of companies were building kiosks, you know, that were COVID kiosks. They had hand sanitizers and they measured your temperature and they kind of gave you a pass fail if you could walk into a, a building or something like that. And I'd be curious to know how many of those technologies that were specifically for COVID actually were sold and used. I don't think AI is kind of on that same path, even though it's definitely a, a something that's in the spotlight right now. I do think it is something that is here to stay. I think we'll, we'll start seeing pretty soon what technologies are really using it, what companies are actually saying they're using it and they're technically not. Um, you know, one of the things that concerns me is that it's being used as a buzzword and it's being yes. used in marketing and things like that. And, you know, to me, AI can be really complicated as far as what it is or what it isn't. Um, it, you know, it's not always complicated, but I think the consumer can be easily fooled thinking that they're getting something because a company is using the term AI and maybe it's not, but customers don't really know. And they just think they're getting some advanced software feature either for free or something like that. So I, I think it's still to be determined, but probably here to stay just depends on which technologies actually work and don't, which will have to be vetted out in the field, I think. I, I love that. You know, one of the best, I think, business pieces of advice, life pieces of advice I ever heard, it was at one of the RFIS annual summits and uh, a guy was representing, I think, 150 year old company. And he said their unofficial in-house motto is, we don't change, we evolve, but we don't change. Mm -hmm. And one of the themes was, look, whatever new technology over 150 years, you can only imagine, right? Right. It's only going to amplify the good or the bad that you're already doing. If you have sound habits as a business and you care about your customers, it's going to amplify that. If you don't have sound habits and you're doing stuff that isn't working, it's going to amplify that. And I think the theme was just, you know, focus at the end of the day on that human impact, add value for your customer, have the servant mindset, you know, make their life easier and with whatever tools come along. And that's what true future proofing is. It's not just using gimmicks and throwing something in and saying, well, look, we have an AI powered digital menu, so we're going to be successful. But that's not how business works. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in the digital signage space, you know, the, at least from where I sit, the, it's the CMS software that really is going to be driving a lot of what's incorporated, what's capable of working. Um, you know, companies like ours and, and other companies that do custom, you know, one-off programming, things like that, we can create stuff, we can program it to do certain things, but I feel like it starts with the ability for uh, the CMS to really allow those types of features, either that they're going to build themselves or that they're going to open up their platform and allow a third party uh, build to come in and, and work hand in hand with that. So we'll see what kind of stuff the software companies end up coming up with. And, and I would add the hardware companies, it's just as important, you know, if, if you're wanting to use cameras and things like that to verify who's doing what or who's using the system, um, you know, you've got to have the hardware that, that can do that as well. But it's to me, from what I've seen, things like the hardware has existed for a while. You know, the cameras that need to be used or the media players and the inputs that they have to be able to, to have, like those things have, have been around for a while. So, you know, my thought is if the software companies are willing to sort of take on some of these challenges and build in some of these functionality and features that are required to make it work, I think we'll see an adaption a lot faster. Uh, I've also seen though that from a software side, a lot of the software companies, you know, it's hard to tell if, if spending tens of thousands of dollars to incorporate something 
is going to be worth their investment. And typically it requires a, probably a large company uh, using that software, like a customer to have that request. And then based on that customer, the software company is going to build that out. So I think there's a lot of factors in how quickly this will grow and be sustained in our industry. I love that. You know, and, and I'm I'm just selfishly going to ask, and, and I respect, thank you for sharing your time with us, by the way, and being so generous. Um, mm-hmm. You've had quite a diverse portfolio internationally of all these fascinating projects. And I'm not blowing smoke, like a genuinely cool crap that you're doing. Oh, we'll keep thank it you. PG-13 crap, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, what if you had one piece of advice, just because you seem like you've built a successful an enjoyable career in this digital signage space, not just with restaurants, but all these different verticals. What is success in digital signage? Like if you had one piece of advice to pay forward to the new generation coming in, what, what would it be? I mean, to me, there's a couple factors that go into success in digital signage. I definitely think financial is one of them. Um, you know, I think if you're not earning any money or your company's not generating enough revenue to sustain itself. It's in my opinion, it's probably not that successful. Um, you know, I get a lot of joy out of the relationships that I have also built with customers and other people in this industry. Um, as a success, I think it's going to be individually determined. So in, in my case, I would consider success I think getting to a point where um, we are able and capable of doing uh, all the things that we want to do on a global scale, that's a a goal for us. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near that yet, even though we do a lot of global deployments. I think there's a lot more for Red Dot to get out and learn and do before I would consider us, uh, you know, a success. I, I think it's always a moving benchmark as well. Um, anyone getting into this business, you know, one of the things I would probably suggest is pick a path specifically. You know, are you someone that's into the technical side? Are you someone that's on the sales side? Or, you know, where is it that you want to go? And then do you enjoy this type of stuff? Do you enjoy the technology? Do you enjoy, uh, the, the software that, that gets used. And, and if you do, I think you're going to be successful in at least having that passion um, for, you know, I think for a lot of people in the digital signage industry, we've sort of just fallen into it, like either purposely or indirectly, you know, for us having been in the AV business, it was a, a fairly easy transition. I mean, digital signage is AV with graphic design work. You know, I mean, it's it, it wasn't a huge, huge leap. Um, mm-hmm. But one thing I will say for new people in this business, especially like younger people, uh, you know, this is not an industry that they're necessarily, at least not that I'm aware of, that they're teaching about in school. It's something that schools use for sure, but they're not necessarily teaching about, you know, majoring in digital signage. I just don't think that's that's anywhere near what's happening. So a lot of times we find, especially younger people coming into this industry, you know, not because they're seeking it out, but because they're uh, looking for a certain role at a, a company. And, and this happens to be a, maybe a role that's open to them. And, you know, I think at some point, if they're not into the technology or into something that has to do with this, it, it's just not going to work out. And their measure of success will be, uh, you know, quickly determined. Mm. But for those of us that have been in the industry a while, I do think that we're all in this industry right now because we see a lot of opportunity and growth, you know, whether it's through something like AI or whether it's just through adoption, you know, 20 years ago, digital signage existed. It's not like this is a five-year-old industry or a 10-year-old industry. I mean, it has been around for a long time, but I think we're just getting to a point where, 
you know, if you're not adopting as a, a company some type of digital signage, you know, you're, I, I don't know what's going on. That it's at the point now where it's so commonly adopted that it's becoming more mainstream. And that's, I think, really driving some of the growth as well. I love that. I love that. And, and I'll just say, uh, personally, uh, you know, been, been in as, as a strange journey, been in a lot of industries, and I've been privileged to meet a lot of folks. And the through line, uh, I think, for happiness and success, whether it's digital signage, you name it, is that passion. And I love hearing the raw passion when I chat with you, when I chat with other folks in the industry, when you're doing something you love and care about and you're leaving a piece of yourself in the world, um, I think that's just a beautiful, sincerely beautiful thing. And we, we just need more of that. We honestly do. Um, I'm just so privileged. Thank you so much for joining us, Daryl. As business leaders look for ways to improve productivity and profitability, they're increasingly turning to innovative automation and self-service technologies. But keeping up with the rapid pace of new innovations can be overwhelming. Now there's a website to help you do just that. From the publishers of Kiosk Marketplace, Vending Times, and Digital Signage Today, Automation and Self-Service covers trends in artificial intelligence, robotics, kiosks, payments, and much more. Visit the site today and subscribe at www.automationandselfservice.com.